I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to the Diversity Action Team's program entitled Inside the Diversity of Asian America. Before we do any um, introductions at all, we need to set some standards and show how the flow will go for this meeting. Um, I'm not seeing the I'm not seeing the, the uh, program. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> yes, this program is presented by the Diversity Action Team of Rock County, but with our partners as well. We could not do these programs without our partners, and they include the Hedberg Public Library, the YWCA of Rock County, and particularly Amy Levy, who takes care of all of our technology. So thank you so much, Amy. The Beloit NAACP branch number 3251, UW-Madison Dis Division of Extension Rock County, Social Justice of Edgerton, and last but not least, the Janesville League of Women Voters. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We also want to recognize that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of Native nations. In Wisconsin, there are 11 federally recognized Native American sovereign nations and one seeking to regain federal recognition. We acknowledge these indigenous communities who have stewarded this land throughout many, many generations. We have much to learn from them, so all of us all of us can become good stewards of our land and communities too. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here is our presentation etiquette. There will be time for Q&A after our speaker finishes. So please, as the speaker is giving her presentation, please ask your questions in the chat and we will handle them after it is, it is completed. Um, please stay muted because we want to hear our presenter and we need everyone to be polite and stay muted. If you have any comments, questions, or recommended resources for us during this presentation, please feel free to share them in the chat portion of the Zoom. As we said before, questions will be handled after the program. And I will, um, if, if someone wants to ask a question anonymously, that is just fine. You can send them directly to me in the chat. Susan Johnson, thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Next slide. <clears throat> and we, we need to help take care of the space for all of our participants. Zoom has many interactive features. Please do not explore them unless invited to do so. <laughs> it distracts um, it, it distracts participants' experience. And if you have a technical issue during the program, please contact Amy Levy in the chat. You are in your home, but you are also in our presentation space. So please make wise audio and visual choices that create the best experience for you and the fewest distractions for our fellow attendees. This session is being recorded and it will be posted and shared. And we will talk about that more later. Okay, um, before... Oh, I wanted to hear. I want to. Oh, I have something to read, but I, I'm not getting it. Um, I'm not sure how to. Anyway. 
it, Amy, is there a way to shrink this screen just temporarily for me so I can reach my, yeah, I want to reach my, my little thing here. All right, before we do introductions, we do want to consider why our program tonight um, was chosen and why it is a topic of critical importance at this time. Discrimination toward and hatred of Asian, Amer of Asian immigrants can be seen in the United States as early as 1882, when Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, prohibiting immigration of Chinese people. And it hits directly home for us here locally in Janesville. We've recently heard the story of Tom Fong, owner of the Cozy Inn restaurant in Janesville, whose father, Wing Sun, happened to be one of the eight Chinese passengers on the Titanic. The story is told in a documentary which was recently shown at the Beloit International Film Festival. It is called The Six because only six of those eight survived. When all of the Titanic survivors arrived in New York City, most received medical attention right away. However, the six Chinese survivors were immediately deported after arriving. In more recent years, we've seen a significant increase in anti-Asian hate. There were 3,800 cases of Asian hate crimes reported throughout the United States in 2020. And in 2021, those numbers increased by 164%. This past fall, two Asian students were attacked in hate crimes on UW-Madison campus. And just last week on March 11th, a woman from the Philippines was attacked in Yonkers, New York. The suspect is charged with attempted murder as a hate crime. Surveillance from the building's lobby shows him assaulting a 67 year old neighbor throwing 125 punches at her and kicking her viciously seven times and spat on her while using anti-Asian slurs. The urgency of this topic is apparent for all. Okay, now I, I need to go back to my screen. Thank you. Please, I am so honored and pleased to welcome you to tonight's program and introduce to you Dr. Stacy Lee. Stacy Lee is the Frederick Erickson Worf Professor of Educational Policy Studies, and she is an, a, a faculty of, of, affiliate in Asian American Studies at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Her research focuses on the role of education in incorporating immigrants into the United States. She is the author of two wonderful books, Unraveling the Model Minority Stereotype, and also Up Against Whiteness, Race, School, and Immigrant Youth. Currently, she is also taking on the role of Associate Dean for the School of Education. Her efforts center on providing leadership, strategic planning, and program support for the development of new and relevant educational programs at the university. Dr. Lee received her PhD in anthropology of education from the University of Pennsylvania in 1991. Without further ado, let's all welcome Dr. Stacy Lee. Hi, Susan, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction and all that nice background information. Um, Amy, do you think I'm up for, can you walk me through how to share screen or do you think maybe I'm technologically not very capable? So you can absolutely do it and I'll walk you through it. And for some reason, if it doesn't work, I have your slides as a backup. I bet I do this, I go to share screen. Correct. You should see several options, double. And then I see my PowerPoint and I click on that, right? Double click. And then please put it in presenter mode. How do I do that? Right at the bottom, the bottom right hand corner, you'll see oh, the zoom in. I think so. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate that and all your help getting this all set up. Um, and before, 
let me just say a little bit about what I want to do tonight. Um, I wanted to, you know, start by giving a, I, what I think will be a relatively brief presentation um, where I'll talk some about um, Asian Americans, the diversity uh, among Asian Americans. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about anti-Asian racism and then talk about the racialization of Asian Americans. And I hope to leave plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion. And so the only other thing I would add is that Susan, I hope my dogs were listening when you said to uh, engage in appropriate Zoom behavior, uh, because I tried to put them in the back room, but they were scratching so much. I thought, okay, fine, you can come in here with me because they're usually quiet at this hour, but let's, let's all hope they are. Okay, so, so the title, great. So, the first uh, slide is really just kind of looking at the US population, right? And so Asian Americans represent nearly 6% of the US population. And as you can see from this slide, you know, the United States is an incredibly diverse nation. Um, and the experiences of Asian Americans are often, often rendered largely invisible by what many people have argued is the predominantly black and white racial paradigm. And so part of what my work has been about thus far is to sort of um, complicate the black and white narrative of race, right? To sort of bring forward the experiences of Asian Americans. So who are Asian Americans? Um, folks who are considered Asian Americans are diverse in terms of ethnic backgrounds, country of origin, generation in the United States, social class, educational backgrounds, religion, language, political perspectives, pretty much, you name it, you got it, really very, very diverse group of people. In terms of ethnic diversity, 20.4 million Asian Americans trace their roots to over 20 countries in East and Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. The largest groups of Asians in the United States are ethnically Chinese, ethnically Indian, and ethnically Filipino. So in a nutshell, Asian Americans include East Asians, such as Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, et cetera. Southeast Asians, such as Hmong, Vietnamese, Lao, Cambodians, and South Asians, such as Indians and Pakistanis. In, in terms of class diversity, Asian Americans are among the most economically divided racial or ethnic group in the US. Indians, Japanese, and Filipinos have the highest median income among Asian Americans, while Bangladeshis, Hmong, Nepalese, and Burmese have the lowest median incomes. Relatedly, Asian Americans have incredible educational diversity. About half of all Asians over 25 years of age have a bachelor's degree compared to 30% of all Americans 25 years of age or older. Indeed, Asian Americans are among the most and the least educated Americans. We're also quite diverse in terms of generation. Some of us have been here multi, multiple generations, tracing our roots to the early 1900s in the United States. My father's family settled in Boston's Chinatown, for example. My mother's family settled in the Mississippi Delta during Jim Crow. Uh, Asian Americans also include relatively recent immigrants, refugees, as well as folks who are transnationals, spending their time both in the U US and in their countries of origin. Today, approximately 59% of Asian Americans were born in another country. So the very large portion of folks are recent immigrants. This is due to the fact that the 1965 Immigration Act abolished the national origins quota system, which had severely limited the entry of immigrants from Asia. Then with the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, Southeast Asian refugees began to enter the United States. So at this point, we have more folks who've entered post-65 than folks who were here before. Asian Americans live in small towns, rural communities, big cities, all across the country. Nearly 30% live in California. That's where I was born and raised. Approximately 23% live in the South, which is where my mother was born and raised and approximately 20% live in the Northeast, where my father was born and raised, and approximately 12% live in the Midwest. 
in Wisconsin, as I'm sure most of you know, um, the, the largest Asian American group is the Hmong population. The largest Hmong communities are in La Crosse, Sheboygan, Green Bay, Wausau, and Milwaukee. So given this incredible diversity, many Asian Americans ask whether or not the Asian American category is at all useful, right? If we are diverse in terms of ethnic background, language, social class, immigrant experience, what's the point of the category, right? So in particular, more recent Asian Americans have questioned this usefulness, raising the sort of two questions below. Should Asian Americans embrace a pan-ethnic or racial identity as Asian Americans, or should we focus on disaggregating data among Asian ethnic groups? In order to answer that question, it's probably important to think a little bit about the origins of the Asian American category. <clears throat> the term Asian American dates back to 1968 when Asian American student activists embraced the term to unite then Ch Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino Americans in their fight against racism. The term also signaled a shared and interconnected history of immigration, labor explo exploitation, and racism, as well as a common political agenda. It was also seen as a pushback against the pejorative word, quote unquote, oriental, right? So it had at its roots, this idea of social justice, bringing people together to fight for social and racial justice. But as the Asian American community has become increasingly diverse, particularly in terms of generation in the United States and ethnic background, there have been many questions among those of us categorized as Asian American whether, about whether or not it's a useful category. To answer that question, I think we have to return to thinking about anti-Asian racism, right? So as we heard earlier, as Susan reported, nearly 3,800 hate incidents were reported to the Stop Hate AAPI group between March 19, 2020 and February 28, 2021. Uh, more recently, we've learned that uh, nearly 11,000 incidents of hate have, were reported between March 2020 and December of 2021. The Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State San Bernardino reported that hate crimes against Asian Americans in the largest US cities surged 149% in 2020, of course, the onset of COVID. <clears throat> and indeed, it's been one year since the shooting rampage in Atlanta, where a man killed eight, including uh, six Asian American women. The Pew Research Center reports that about three in 10 Asian adults, or about 31%, say they have been subjected to slurs or jokes because of their race or ethnic identity since the outbreak began. And I think if we actually asked Asian American adults whether or not they had ever been subjected to slurs or jokes because of their race or ethnic identity, I can't imagine that there's a single person that would actually say they hadn't experienced that, regardless of where they grew up. So where, where did all the anti-Asian racism come from? How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of the rise in anti-Asian racism since 2020? Ah, okay, so wait, I think, I think maybe, yes, okay, sorry. I was clicking and it wasn't doing it and then it clicked too forward. In order to answer that question, we have to think about the racialization of Asian Americans. And I wanna talk about two stereotypes that face Asian Americans. One is the idea of Asian Americans as a perpetual foreigner rooted in this idea of Asians as a yellow peril. And the second stereotype is the idea of Asian Americans as a model minority. Hmm. Not changing slides. Amy, what, what, do, what, do I, what do I do if it's not changing? Cover your mouse over the bottom left-hand corner and you should see some forward and backward arrows. You ah, can click on those. Thank you. Okay. No Look, I'm learning all kinds of things. I really appreciate this. Okay. Um, perpetual foreigner. Perhaps the oldest stereotype facing Asian Americans is that they are perpetual foreigners who are unable or unwilling to assimilate 
as perceived foreigners, Asian Americans are understood to be a threat to the nation. On a national level, anti-Asian racism has taken the form of exclusionary immigration and naturalization policies and narratives that position Asian Americans as permanent outsiders to the nation. The Page Act of 1875 was the first restrictive federal immigration law in the United States. This was a law that effectively prohibited the entry of Chinese women, marking the end of open borders. With the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, Chinese immigrants became the first group to be subjected to exclusionary immigration policies. Thus, contrary to hegemonic narratives that depict the United States as a nation of immigrants, the experiences of Chinese Americans demonstrates that immigration policies have long been gatekeeping policies that have played a central role in the racial and cultural makeup of the nation. The rhetoric surrounding Chinese exclusion relied on the idea that Chinese immigrants were permanently alien and therefore threatening to the nation. As historian Mei Nai explains, quote, immigration policy is constitutive of Americans' understanding of national membership and citizenship, drawing lines of inclusion and exclusion that articulate a desired composition, imagined, if not necessarily realized, of the nation, end quote. The anti-Chinese sentiment that fueled Chinese exclusion quickly extended to other Asians, including Japanese, Korean, and Indian immigrants. So today, the perpetual foreigner stereotype is still with us, right? And I, I would argue, as many have who, who work with Asian American communities, that this is at the root of the uptick in anti-Asian racism that we've experienced since COVID, since 2020. The perpetual foreigner stereotype also, often also takes the form of jokes, so-called jokes about people's accents, right? Qu questions about where are you from, but where are you really from, right? So while, while white immigrants, while white immigrants um, are absorbed into the nation within a generation and have the option of identifying with their ethnic origins, multiple generation Asian Americans remain identified as perpetual foreigners whose status is tied to their ancestral homelands. Um, this next slide points to the fact that as schools started to reopen in 2021, um, many Asian American families were afraid to send their kids back to school, afraid to send their kids back to school, not because of COVID particularly, but because they were afraid that their children would be blamed for COVID. The next stereotype I want to spend a little time with is the origin uh, is the model minority stereotype. Okay. This is the idea that Asian Americans are all high achieving, they're good students, they're successful economically, and they're non-complaining, right? They're quiet, they're passive, they're hardworking, and they're successful. They're good at math. So where did this stereotype come from? This particular stereotype was promoted by the mainstream press at the height of the civil rights era. It was used indeed to discipline um, black folks, brown folks, and including Asian American folks who were fighting for civil rights, right? So the idea of a model minority at that point, Chinese and Japanese Americans, was premised on the idea that there was a non-model minority. So folks who do this kind of work often talk about the fact that while this is a seemingly positive stereotype, it was intentionally used against other groups of color um, as a kind of racial wedge. So the dangers of the model minority stereotype, just to repeat, is that it, is the stereotype denies the diversity among Asian Americans. So if we think back to earlier in the presentation, we might remember that Asian Americans um, are incredibly diverse in terms of economic background and educational background. The model minority stereotype, however, erases that diversity. It denies the fact that Asian Americans struggle. In fact, it suggests that Asian Americans don't face racism. And as I was saying just a minute ago, the stereotype is used to discipline or silence other groups of color. And finally, the very idea of Asian Americans as being successful can be flipped and turned into being seen as a problem, right? Asians can be seen as good news when they're successful, 
or bad news when they're successful, they become a threat. And at that moment, they become once again, yellow peril. So these two stereotypes, although seemingly different, kind of work in concert, right, um, to fuel anti-Asian racism, particularly at different moments when Asians appear to be a threat. And we can see anti-Asian racism playing out in schools. Asian American youth face very high rates of uh, racist bullying, for example. Indeed, Asian Americans report higher levels of racial discrimination, this is talking about kids in schools, than other groups of color. Asian American youth experience racial discrimination, including physical, slapping and pushing, verbal, name calling, mocking of accents by non-Asian peers, right? Despite the idea that Asians don't suffer racism, they clearly do. So this is, this is why we, we need to remember um, and talk about race, not only in terms of black and white, but also in terms of other groups of color, right? Um, and I'm hoping that this little brief presentation can get us thinking about um, what we might do to challenge anti-Asian racism um, and how we can better understand it and, and work against it. I'll, I'll end by saying, with respect to the question about whether or not the category of Asian American is useful, I would say that indeed there are similarities and differences among Asian Americans, right? Asian Americans are an incredibly diverse group of people. We do need to continue to push towards um, disaggregated data. Many school districts are working to disaggregate their data for Asian Americans to see the differences in academic achievement and academic needs. But Asian Americans do share some common experiences, particularly common experiences with racialization and stereotyping and racism. So it's, it's not an easy question to answer whether or not the Asian American category is useful or, or not. I would myself argue that it is useful, but it has limited usefulness, right? We share some things in common. There are reasons that those of us who identify as Asian American should try to work together. But there are also differences among our, in, within our community that are very important that we have to also recognize if we are to address the concerns of the most vulnerable members of our community. So we need to sort of a both hand, we need to do both. Okay. So I have a few um, resources, um, websites and groups that are I think doing really important work to challenge anti-Asian racism, um, and also places where you can get more information. Okay. I think I, as promised, I kept it relatively short. Um, professors are often known for, to not be able to do that, but I, so I did that and um, hope that folks have questions. Now, how do I get rid of this? <laughs> You want to hover your mouse over the top of the screen and stop sharing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, stop share. Okay. Oh, oh no. Okay. Yes. Did I do that? I think yeah. I stopped. Okay. You're good. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I think that you did a a fabulous job walking me through that. My, my TAs will be impressed. Okay, do folks have questions or thoughts? Yeah. Anything you'd like to know about? This is the time to ask, uh, either raise your hand or write it in the chat. I haven't really seen many questions yet, um, except for this one. Sure. Can um, you I I can tell you a little bit about a book that um, my grad students and I have just finished that will come out in the fall. Ooh, fantastic, um, please do. So uh, the title of the book is Resisting Asian American Invisibility. And um, I had the fort good fortune of working with three of my graduate students. So I have to uh, give them a shout out before I continue. Um, Linda Fang, who is a PhD student in Ed Policy Studies. Jua Zhang, 
uh, who just completed her PhD in Ed Policy Studies. And finally, Mainang Vang, who um, is a PhD student in Ed Policy Studies. So the three of them um, worked with me on this project. Uh, we, we did two years of ethnographic field work in a city we call Lakeview with a particular focus on the Hmong community. Um, we were interested in um, how the Hmong community was navigating um, the invisibility that they faced, right? So we spent time, we did field work for a year in one of the high schools we call University Heights High. In many ways, the field work at University Heights High was a uh, follow-up to the work that I had done in the early 2000s that led to the book Up Against Whiteness. So we returned to that school to see what was going on for uh, Hmong and other Southeast Asians at University Heights High. We were particularly interested in how um, current educational reforms, particularly around testing and accountability, were shaping the experiences of Hmong students. What we learned rather quickly was that Hmong students were rendered invisible by um, the broader kind of dis racial discourse that centered on black and white students. And they had been uh, rendered what we refer to as hypervisible by um, testing and accountability practices that left many Hmong students trapped in long-term ESL. Um, as long-term ESL students, they became what we call hypervisible in so much as they became seen as the quote unquote failed or failing um, Asian Americans. That is, they didn't live up to this model minority stereotype. So we argue that in many schools in Lakeview, and as we were able to sort of see across the nation, are both rendered invisible because of, in part because of their relatively small numbers, but also because of a larger um, racial context that centers whiteness and blackness. They had also become misrecognized by educational policies. We then spent time collecting uh, data with on two uh, Hmong community groups, adults, uh, who were trying to push back against the perceived and I would argue real invisibility that Hmong folks faced um, in Lakeview and I think these, active, these, these educational advocates would say throughout the state of Wisconsin and in much of the nation. What we found is that um, the community though relatively small really approached their educational advocacy in very different ways. Um, the one group, the more kind of middle-class Hmong folks uh, who were working as professionals in many of them in education and in state government um, really viewed education as the route to social mobility. They were concerned about the high rates of Hmong students who were not doing well in school, but, uh, according to testing, um, and many, the many who were trapped in ESL. And they really fought for greater inclusion, um, really pushing for things like culturally responsive pedagogy. In contrast to that group, we also did work with uh, with another group of Hmong folks who worked very closely with the black community. And they argued that the, their main goal was to fight racism and particularly anti-blackness based on the assumption that when anti-blackness was overcome, that racism against all groups would be overcome. And their educational advocacy really focused on getting police out of schools. And so part of the story that we're telling is that there's an agreement that there's a problem, but there's some disagreement even within the community on the nature of the problem and the nature of the solution. And we try to sort of highlight the fact that um, even within relatively small um, ethnic groups, there's incredible diversity. There's class diversity and there's political diversity and it leads to different kinds of advocacy. Um, so this, this is my, this latest work will come out in the fall. We, uh, my, my students and I published a couple of articles based off of this work. Um, we've, we've really been working on the project since 2015. So it's been a long time coming and we're all very happy that it's finally done, um, was just delivered to the press two weeks ago. Um, I'm also doing research uh, uh, on Chinese Americans who grew up and went to school in the Jim Crow South. Um, they were among the first um, non-white 
students to attend white schools. And I finished collecting the data, it was life history interviews with 28 um, folks who ranged in age at the time of my data collection, 92, the youngest was maybe 64. Um, and I'm, I'm planning to write a book based on this research as well. I have published one article based on this. <laughs> Sorry, this, hey, shh, shh, shh. Um, Lola, you, 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 got, you, you interrupted me. Now I can't remember what I was going to say. Uh, so that's really a, a story about kind of how um, Chinese Americans who, when they first settled in the Mississippi Delta, were categorized as Black um, and how they worked to kind of position themselves as a distinct racial group, as neither white nor Black, right? um, and, and the role of schooling in that strategy. And their and their life trajectories. So it's the data is collected. I've been doing some thinking. I tried to work on both projects at the same time and realized I wasn't making much headway. So turned uh, much of my attention for the last two years primarily to the Hmong project. Um, I also do other sort of smaller projects on the side, but those are the kind of big projects I've been working on in the last um, five or so years. We are beginning to get questions in the chat now. So one of them is, please speak more about the dangers of racialization. So, I mean, I think racialization is inevitable. What much, much of my early research demonstrates is that, you know, Asian immigrant kids come to this country, Asian refugee kids and immigrant kids come to this country and they see themselves as primarily members of their own, their particular ethnic groups, right? They're Chinese, they're Vietnamese, they're Korean or whatever. Um, it's, but the United States is a, is a country built on race, right? It's foundational to our very na nation. So you can't really avoid it. These kids can't avoid it any more than any of the rest of us can avoid it. Um, so we become, we get categorized into a particular racial group and along with that categorization comes a bunch of assumptions and history and sort of what um, Natalie, Natalia Molina, historian Natalia Molina refers to as racial scripts, right? The stories that accompany your group, whether or not those stories are true for you or not, they become part of how you are understood by others, particularly those outside of your group. And that has, serious implications both on an individual or interpersonal level, but it also has implications on a structural level, right? Because it's individuals who make policies and structures um, and, those, and those, those stories, those scripts shape the kinds of policies um, that you end up facing in schools if you're an immigrant kid, um, how your teachers and your peers perceive you. And I, I guess I, I would press on the idea that the stereotype of Asians as model minorities is, is a really important one to think about because it seems like it's a positive stereotype, right? Um, unlike stereotypes of other groups, it's seemingly positive. You know, people are saying um, you're well-behaved, you're good citizens, you're high achieving, you're smart, you're good at math, right? That all seems like quote unquote good news. Um, but if we look at how it, both erases the struggles that some Asian Americans have, um, the fact that Asian Americans are diverse in terms of their actual achievement, right? But, and so that's one problem, but we also see how the stereotype is used against black and brown communities. Then we can see that what it seems like a positive stereotype is actually quite dangerous. It's dangerous, I would argue, for Asian Americans, but it's dangerous also for other groups of color. So, Racialization is inevitable at this moment, but it is dangerous. And let's just take the model minority one uh, because it's, it's, it's a curious one because it seems like it's positive, right? Uh, the perpetual foreigner stereotype um, is one that we can't escape either. I think that one is more obviously dangerous, right? So if you're always seen as an outsider, you're never part of the group, part of the nation. Um, that means you're your safety here, right, is always conditional and partial. Does that answer the question? Does that, was that what people were 
I think so. Um, okay. What are some strategies to improve inclusive, inclusivity and gaining trust among Asian Americans? So I'm an educational researcher. So um, my answer to that question always turns first to schools, right? What can and should schools be doing? And um, one of the things that my students and I write about is the idea of a culturally sustaining pedagogy um, for Hmong and other Southeast Asians, but, but some version of this could be used for Asian Americans in general and indeed other groups, right? And by it's culturally sustaining pedagogy builds on the work of culturally relevant pedagogy, uh, the work of my colleague, Gloria Ladson Billings, um, that argued that you know, we need to build on, it's exactly, um, the cultural and historical backgrounds of our, our, the young people in our schools, see those things as strengths. And we need to simultaneously teach people real and honest history, um, the good and the bad news, right? Um, how do we make sense of where we are if we don't consider both the good and the bad news? Right? How do we how do we fight against the bad news if we deny it? Right? Um, I would argue you cannot. Right? Um, so we we need to start in schools with young people um, in age appropriate ways. I study primarily high school students, and so that's a much older group than say elementary age students. Um, where I think by high school we can have honest conversations about um, you know history as well as giving people opportunities to explore their own experiences, to explore their own communities. We were struck, for example, by the fact that um, many Hmong youth don't really even know their own histories, right? Just one generation removed, you know, actually it's two generations removed from the refugee experience by and large. Um, so the children of, of um, US born or 1.5 generation Hmong folks, um, so the grandchildren of refugees in most cases, that they don't really know why their families are here. They know it's something vague about a war, something vague about their grandparents having sacrificed and died, but they don't really know. And the older generation, some, some families, like, like families in any group, right? Some are more forthcoming and willing and able to share and others are more reserved and don't share. Right. There are also linguistic gaps now between US born kids in school and their grandparents generation. Right. So there are lots of reasons that kids don't know, but it's also because their stories and their histories aren't told in our schools. And I was we were really also struck by the fact that um, unlike in the early 2000s, when teachers knew really you know, who Hmong folks were and why they were here um, right now. Again, it's you know, some teachers knew, so that was the good news, but many didn't, or they had very vague, yeah, something about the Vietnam War, right? Like, you know, what is relatively recent history is sort of treated in this country as ancient history. And we forget our history at our own peril, right? Um, and so I think, you know, teaching honest US history, you know, how is it that folks came to be here? Why are they here? And I think it would allow kids to actually, you know, feel like they're, you know, part of this nation, which is, I think, what we all hope, right, but also connected to their families, understanding what their parents and their grandparents are even talking about when they say, we sacrificed for you, right, because um, like a lot of young people, I think they're like, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're talking about, and so schools, you know, allowing and encouraging kids um, to bring their cultures into the schools and learn their histories, and I think this is good not just for in the case of Hmong history and Hmong American history, this isn't just good for Hmong students. We argue it's good for all of us. It's good for all Americans to understand how were refugees created, right? Refugees are social con socially constructed. They're constructed by political events. Um, and we have to understand that they don't just come to be kind of from the sky. And, you know, this will help us become better citizens, make decisions about who we want to represent us, you know, and the policies that we do or don't support. More questions. Uh, let's see. So what, what else uh, do you recommend for Wisconsin schools? I know you talked about, um, you know, teaching the truth, um, what else? 
what else can they do? So with high school students, I think um, participatory action research can actually be very powerful. Yeah. Um, when kids go out and they, and this again can be any group, we, you know, most of my work of late is focused on Hmong and Southeast Asian youth, but it can be done with any group. We actually, so my colleague Maggie Hawkins and I did a project um, that was not focused on Asian Americans. It was a project we call Wisconsin Story Bridges. And it was a collaboration uh, or a partnership, I should say, with uh, six school districts in Wisconsin. Um, actually teachers in six different school uh, districts in Wisconsin. And the idea was to work with teachers to train them about um, participatory action research and to train them to use this website that Maggie had, uh, Hawkins had created. And the idea was to have young people explore issues of concern to them in their own communities. Um, do research, go out and, you know, interview people, read newspapers, get into the archives, collect stories, as it were, and then create a video based on what they found. The idea was to upload these videos to this dedicated website that they would then share with these kids in the other districts. And the hope was that they would then have conversations across difference, which this is a long winded example of saying, we need to not only talk amongst our within group, but we need to talk across groups as well, right? And this project was designed to do that. Unfortunately, the project fell victim to COVID. Um, it started in the fall of 2020, and we were we underestimated how much launching time it would take, <laughs> um, and it really didn't. I mean, even though we started in August of 2020, it wasn't until December of 2020 that the schools really started to take off and um, the kids started to identify projects that were of interest to them. So um, one school district, I, can't, I, I won't name, we don't name those districts, but this is a primarily white school district of rural uh, working class and lower income students. Um, the kids came up with the idea of studying mental health issues uh, among young people in their community. Um, like many rural communities, this was a, was a community where young people had struggled with drug addiction, mental health, blah, blah, blah. So they went out and they did this really phenomenal project where they interviewed youth and they talked to police officers and, you know, here's the problem and this is what's going on in our community and they created a video. Um, another community was, was, a, was primarily, the group was primarily Hmong students and they were um, wanting to um, look at um, racism against Asians, right, in their community. And so we, it was really kind of taking off. And the idea was for them to share their stories across these racial uh, differences in these different towns. Um, and then COVID hit. <laughs> and we learned the, really on the ground what it means when people have unequal access to technology, and some, some districts were able to continue, others weren't. Then of course, when everything shut, you know, we, we, we weren't able to visit the schools, long-winded way of saying, we think we had what was a great idea. We learned things from the limited success. Some of the failure, I think, you know, was it's just a victim of, of COVID. It's a long-winded way of saying, I think, you know, kids going out and learning about things in their own communities is a really great way of getting us to kind of talk to understand ourselves and then understand each other, which I, I really hope that schools really can do a better job of, right? I think we all have the right to understand ourselves in our own communities, but we have the need to understand others as well. Um, and projects like this have the potential to do that. We sadly don't have a lot of evidence because we ended up only with two districts who were able to continue for the two years because the the, the length of the research literally went the length of the, you know, one, it was two years and one of a, one and a half years of that project was spent in lockdown. Um, so Maggie Hawkins and I are still trying to decide if there's anything we can write based on this that's new. I mean, we certainly learned about, you know, unequal access to technology, but a lot of people are writing that story. So we're not sure we have anything new to add. But we still thought 
you know, the, the project had power and we've just gone on to do other things, but we may come back to it because the idea of kids doing research in their communities and then sharing across communities um, was very powerful for both of us. And for the teachers who were involved, at least until they became overwhelmed with COVID, they were very excited. Yeah, I really love the idea of having students do do their own research, collect their own stories, and then share all together. Um, we're living in such a difficult time. Um, one, one thing that crossed my mind as you were speaking about this wonderful project was that, um, how do you see us working through the deep, deep, deep divides um, in the state of Wisconsin in terms of education, because we do have people who would certainly, uh, lots of people who would certainly agree with you that we need to tell the truth, that that is what we really need to do, yes. But we, we seem very far away from that point. How can we all get from the point where we're at now, which to me really is further away from where we need to be than we've ever been in my lifetime. So how can we, how can we bridge that and reach a point where teachers feel free to tell the truth? I think that's a really, that's, that's, the, that's the, what we used to say, the $6 million question, right? Um, and I don't sadly think there are any easy answers to it. And I think lots of us are asking that question. And in fact, Maggie Hawkins and I came up with this Wisconsin Story Bridges project. Um, we started thinking about it shortly after 2016 and we saw sort of how divided the country had become, the state of Wisconsin had become. And we were trying to sort of think of a project um, that could encourage civil dialogue across difference, right? So we, we, have, to, we have to get to know each other um, and understand each other's perspectives, right? And understand that the division is bad for all of us, really, right? It's, um, if we can agree on that, division is bad, right? Um, that doesn't mean we need to or have to or should agree about everything. We can disagree. We should disagree. Disagreement can actually be very generative, but we need to do so civilly and we need to ask questions of each other um, and try to understand different perspectives. We, we've sort of lost our way there and we had hoped that the Wisconsin Story Bridge is starting with young people because frankly, I think young people are often easier to get at. Um, and I'm old enough now I can say that without feeling like it's super ageous because it's like I include, right? Like it's, you know, it's, it's just when you meet 15 year olds, right? These are really kids. Um, it's not that they don't have ideas and opinions. My 11 year old niece has really strong opinions, but I think the beauty of a kid is that, you know, if you get them excited about something and they invest in it and then they can talk to each other about it, there's really, real, there's possibility there, not, you know, um, and it's just the possibility to see another side, to hear another side, to think about things slightly differently, right? Um, and so we, we, we intentionally picked districts where all of the students were in some way considered marginalized, right? So we don't, we didn't have a district or include a group of kids who were um, upper middle class and you know, identified as white. We had white kids, but they were rural and low income. We were like, so, so that was the common ground of like, you know, groups struggle around race, class, you know, um, immigrant status, language, all, all different things. How can we understand our differences? How can we first understand ourselves? Because I think a lot of times kids don't really even understand their own groups very well. So we have to understand ourselves first. And then we have to sort of reach out and try to understand across, right? Um, and I think the, the example of the kids who did the project um, on high rates of mental health issues in their community, we're beginning to be able to see the link between um, 
economic precarity, right? And um, drug use, right? And addiction, right? And, and the lack of access to um, adequate mental health services, right? So, you know, they start to understand that this is part of a bigger, their, their experiences are part of a bigger systemic problem. And then they can share those experiences just in case, you know, people think white kids don't have problems. They're able to say, well, yeah, we're white and, you know, but here's, you know, and what we hope to get at eventually is white kids may experience, and I would argue do experience white privilege, but that's just one aspect of a group's identity. And these kids, for example, experience economic disadvantage that affects all aspects of their lives. Um, and so that kids can sort of talk across these differences and understand, understand not only themselves, but others, and also understand how different identities kind of intersect with each other, right? That race intersects with gender, intersects with social class, religion, et cetera, right? So it's, I would argue that, you know, um, Susan, you started the conversation this evening by po um, pointing to the um, recent attack in Yonkers on the Asian American woman. It's, it's, not, an, it's, it's not insignificant or accidental uh, that many of the attacks on Asian Americans have been on um, Asian American women, right? So kind of the intersections of race and gender are quite profound here, right? Racism and misogyny kind of acting hand in hand. Very true. Um, I'm looking at the could, chat to see. Sure. If you could change one law, what would it be? Or if you had a million dollars, what would you spend it on? <laughs> <laughs> um, I never imagined being that powerful. Um, I might have to come back to that. And I'm really flummoxed. My, my students are always like, you always have something to ramble on about. I think because I, I don't dream of uh, being able to be all powerful, I, I try to do work with what we have and kind of push a little bit. Um, I mean, I think clearly our schools need more equitable funding, right? So the sort of the obvious and easiest answer would be something like that. Um, you know, there are laws uh, sort of popping up in different states um, requiring ethnic studies. Um, you know, California just passed uh, a law requiring um, the teaching of ethnic studies in the K-12. Um, many of us are not sure how to feel about that because on the one hand, we think that's great news. I think that all students should be exposed to ethnic studies. This is part of my whole US history is ethnic studies, right? Um, but the part of me, and I think some of my colleagues are concerned about is you make a requirement that if we don't actually support folks to do this work in a meaningful way, if we don't help teachers you know, implement these policies, what is seemingly a good policy can actually fail, right? And do damage, right? So while I think many of us are excited about um, the teaching of ethnic studies in the state of California, right? Um, we are concerned that unless there is also support for teachers learning how to do something that for most of them is going to be different than what they have done before, might mean to at best a rather superficial approach to ethnic studies, or at worst, one that causes more problems, right? So, um, you know, laws are curious that way, right? So if, you know, I know that many in the Hmong community, for example, across the nation have been pushing to have Hmong history and culture taught in schools. And many in the Hmong community actually feel quite strongly about that. But when you talk to um, Hmong folks who do research, you know, educational research, um, I think there's both a hope that on the one hand that happens but a recognition that a law um, in and of itself isn't going to fix anything if people don't have the support to implement these policies properly. So I guess I would say I would support ethnic studies, but we also need money to, and opportunities for teachers and support for teachers to do this work, right? Um, otherwise we can't blame them if the work is not done well. <laughs>
Um, how divide our Asian Americans based in social class and education? So um, I think the question is, I think you're asking to say perhaps a little bit more about that divide. Um, and I think the simplest way to put it would be to say, Asian Americans um, bo are both economically uh, among the kind of highest earners, but they're also, depending on the group, among the lowest, they experience very high rates of poverty. Similarly, education, right? Sort of many Asian Americans um, with high, high levels of education and others with very limited formal education and literacy skills. So you, you're probably all familiar about um, the debate right now going on around affirmative action that has centered on and around um, Asian Americans um, in higher ed, particularly at elite institutions like Harvard, University of North Carolina, and a group of um, Chinese Americans in particular, but other Asian Americans as well, who've been um, engaged in a lawsuit uh, against Harvard and their holistic admissions practices. Um, what we know is that actually they're more, Asian, you know, if we look across Asian America, most Asian Americans actually support some form of affirmative action. Um, but right now the, the group getting the largest and the, you know, the, the loudest voice and the most attention, I should say, are the um, relatively smaller group of Asian Americans, particularly Chinese Americans, most, and the, this group, particularly um, highly educated middle-class Chinese Americans who um, are fighting against affirmative action. Um, and actually, I've been working on an article with um, Eugene Park, who is um, a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. She's a uh, former grad student in my department um, and one of my grad students, Gab Gabrielle Hernandez. We've been working on another research project that looks at sort of um, the, the work of kind of anti-affirmative action Asian Americans, trying to understand who they are and how they're making sense of race, merit, and the role of higher education. And the, the, we're, we're still kind of, what we've done is kind of a discourse analysis of all the kind of public materials that the three main groups have. So websites, that we've looked at their amicus, amicai brief and things like that. And one of the things that we're, we're sort of coming to is that while they use the language of Asian America, they keep saying it's, you know, affirmative action is bad for all Asian Americans. They don't really appear to be talking about or for all Asian Americans because they, for example, have come out against data disaggregation. Almost all Asian Americans who are interested in ju social justice have been pushing for disaggregated data for literally decades at this point, right? Um, and I would argue that, you know, data disaggregation is crucial to understanding the particular concerns and needs facing the Asian American communities that struggle the most, right? That their struggles get hidden by the aggregate data, right? So it was very curious to us, Eugene Park and Gabrielle Hernandez and I, that these groups keep using the language of Asian America and what's best for Asian Americans, but they've come out strongly against disaggregated data. So we, we would argue you can't really be for all Asian Americans and be against disaggregating data because it's only through disaggregation that we can reveal the complexity, diversity and variation among Asian Americans. So, you know, but I think again, this whole affirmative action fight demonstrates that Asian Americans as a group are incredibly diverse, politically diverse, and with very diverse and divergent interests, right? So actually the point I was trying to make before I gave all that background was to say that we have all this attention on, as a kind of in the national landscape, Asian Americans who go to Harvard, right? And there are a large number of Asian Americans at Harvard, right? But what we also know, and that gets a lot less attention, is that the majority of Asians actually go to community colleges. Um, 
because they can't afford to go to other kinds of schools. There's no, and I don't think there's any harm or you know, problem with going to a community college, but that's a very different experience instead of opportunities than going to Harvard, right? And we, we're, we're told, you know, the model minority stereotype would have us think all Asians are headed to Harvard. All Asians aren't headed, headed to Harvard. There's particular types of Asians who are headed to Harvard. There are many, many more who are complex reasons would never dream of going to Harvard or any other selective university, including the UW-Madison, right? Um, so disaggregating data is the only way we can get at, you know, that diversity. Ah, are colleges working towards improving ethnic studies for teacher education? What is UW-Madison doing? We are constantly working on trying to um, better prepare our pre-service teachers for the growing diversity of Wisconsin schools and schools across the nation. This is an ongoing conversation. Um, in fact, um, I work in, I do some teaching in the secondary ed master's program at UW-Madison. And in fact, I think I might've just missed the last meeting, but there was um, a meeting about sort of, well, one of my colleagues did a uh, sort of a self-study of our program. You know, what are we doing right? What are we not doing right? So I think actually moments of reflection are super important for doing a better job. So we have been undergoing this moment of reflection. What do, what do we do well in our program? I think there's lots we do well. What can we do better? And one of the things we've come back to is we can do still yet a better job of preparing our predominantly, although not exclusively, white pre-service teachers to work with diverse groups of students. We've long had that as a goal. I think we do a meaningful job, but as with almost anything, we can do better. And we're taking this moment to kind of reflect on what would it look like to do better, right? Um, again, not to always go back to COVID, but I think actually the last two years in COVID really sort of made it more difficult because we were teaching at least the first year online, their field placements, at least the first year were online. Um, this is, you know, we're, we're trying to recalibrate after all of that, right? And to sort of say, okay, you know, hopefully we're through the worst of it, uh, the pandemic that is. And, you know, how can we, you know, move forward, learn from what, what has happened, um, and so reflecting on all that, I've also just recently been assigned to a committee, um, university-wide committee, to think about the ethnic studies requirement across the undergraduate curriculum. Um, so that I just literally right before spring break got asked to join that committee. So I'll be curious to see kind of how the committee is kind of thinking about how we can do a better job of educating all UW undergraduate students about diversity um, as we move forward. So I often teach ethnic studies courses, which I think is, and I do this kind of research, which is how I ended up on the committee. So we, the good news is we're continuing to think and think about how we can do, do what we do well and continue to do it well and do more of what's good and how to sort of shift what is less um, successful. So there was a question about what resources are currently available for teachers related to ethnic studies. I, you know, um, the, the first answer that comes to my mind, I think because I was asked to review the book, um, some of you may know the book, uh, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Um, this has gotten a lot of press and she's coming out with a young adult version of the book. So I haven't actually read it yet. So I don't know that I, <laughs> And I don't know that I'll have time to read it and, and write a blurb for it. Um, but I think it's, it's what it says to me is that there's a kind of big understanding in many different circles that we need to do more at all different levels, right? We need to do more with young people in our schools. And I, I would imagine, though, again, I haven't read the book, um, that Robin D'Angelo and her colleagues are trying to figure out how can we have this conversation about whiteness in a, in a way that is age appropriate, right? For um, upper middle school and high school age students, right? Which I think means that it has to be different than the book that was written that targeted adults, college students and older, right? Um, 
because I do think we, we have to pay attention to where people are developmentally and otherwise, right? Um, so I think there's more of that kind of stuff going on um, and that book being one that um, speaks, to, I think, to this particular moment. When we go back to the introductory slide, um, we see that you received your bachelor's degree in political science. And so if you could speak to the, the jump from, from political science to um, anthropology and education and how, <laughs> how was that jump made? I, I think in as much as anything that just had to do with being young. Um, so I have both a bachelor's and a master's in poli-sci actually. Um, I was, I've always been interested in issues of inequality, particularly inequality around race. And frankly, when I was in college, um, I took some classes with professors who were doing things I found interesting. And like a lot of young people, that's how I picked a major. Um, and I was so excited by what my then college professors were doing that I thought that's what I wanted to do. And so I went right to graduate school only to discover that I did not want to be a political scientist. And um, had a conversation with my graduate advisor at the time. And he said, yeah, you probably don't want to be a political scientist. What you say you want to do is not going to be what you're most likely able to do here. And um, I sort of panicked, right? Like a lot of 23 year olds. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> right? Um, and I got a job working as an admissions recruiter for um, a small Catholic women's college in New York City, Marymount, Manhattan, which is not where I went to school, but it was frankly the first job I could get. And I you know, wasn't in school anymore, so I needed to get a job. And actually it turned out to be a phenomenal job for me because as I said, I've long been interested in racial inequality and class inequality in particular, and never thought I would study education because my mother is a retired high school algebra teacher. And I thought, well, I'm not gonna do what mom does, right? Again, 23 year old thinking. And um, I took this job and recruited in schools throughout New York City, Westchester County and Long Island. And I was really struck by the inequities across the schools, right? So it all of a sudden occurred to me that I could study inequality in schools. And so probably it's, it's worth mentioning that I grew up in a sort of middle-class, predominantly white suburb in California, right? So I kind of theoretically knew there were inequalities, but I didn't really understand it in a concrete way. And when I went into schools in the South Bronx and in Brooklyn, and then went into schools in Westchester County, it really, really became very clear to me that there are profound uh, inequalities in our schools. There continue to be profound inequalities around uh, along the lines of race and class in our schools um, that, really in many ways prevent us from making good on um, the American dream, right, of social mobility, right? So I was, I, I thought, oh, I should study schools. Um, and I started to apply to graduate schools and I saw, I'm like, wonder what this anthro event thing is and trying to sit, you know, you know, and what's the difference between that and qualitative sociology of ed? it's probably beyond this particular conversation, but there are very many similarities. And I ended up going to Penn and working with um, Fred Erickson, hence I am the Fred Erickson Wharf Professor of um, Educational Policy Studies. Um, and he introduced me to ethnography and sort of how to approach research in this way. And um, I got lucky, right? Mm -hmm. I got a, a good mentor and, Landed this job right out of graduate school and have been here since. Never, never thought I'd spend this much time in the Midwest. Still don't like the weather. I'm a Californian. Still don't like the weather. Although it was nice earlier in the day. Yes, so. it was. <laughs> so you spoke earlier about um, the locations in Wisconsin where 
there are a greater number of Asian Americans. Um, so teachers there would definitely have a lot to work with in terms of uh, going to do that action research like you were talking about. But what should schools do that are predominantly white and don't have many Asian American students uh, living there? So what, what could we do to help teach Asian American history and, and the ethnic studies issues? Um, what would we do then? So in some ways, I mean, I mean, Asian American studies and other forms of ethnic studies are important for members of the specific groups, but they're important for all of us, right? We should all learn about, you know, Black history, Black history, Black, you know, African American history is U.S. history, right? Um, you know, so, you know, we, we need to learn about our Indigenous, you know, um, communities. That's U.S. history, right? So, I, you know, I, I think it's about history, right? But I think actually given the kind of work that I do, in addition to teaching history, I think it's important to talk to kids about the assumptions they have about different groups. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you, what, what do you, what do you know about, what do you think you know about Asian Americans, right? Um, and it's very likely that after kind of asking that question, some kids would go, well, I don't know, I don't know anything. And then very quickly, kids would start generating lists that are kind of based in stereotype, right? Because we learn a lot about the other, that is any group we don't belong to, from popular culture, right? And the news. It's not always good news. I'm not saying it's good that we learn from popular culture, but we do, right? Young people do, there's, there's research that backs that up, right? It's also common sense, it would tell us. That's where we think we're learning about people. So what are we learning? What are the stereotypes we have about Asian Americans? And so, you know, this is not to call you out, right? And in some ways it's easier to do when there are no Asians in the room, right? Speak your truth. <laughs> okay, and then, okay, where'd you get those ideas, right? Um, and then you have those conversations and you say, okay, would you be surprised to know that Asian Americans have been here for centuries? Would you be surprised to know that this stereotype uh, the, you know, whichever is the foreigner has been used in this way or model minority in this way, right? Um, and so we, 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 reach, we, we reach out to them where they are, right? Um, and again, I have not a clue for younger kids because I study high school students, but, but, but certainly I've not yet met a high school student that if honest, wouldn't be able to say they have assumptions about other groups most of them assumptions they've either developed based on interactions or popular culture. So we reach them where they are, right? Um, and again, sometimes easier when the person they're talking about isn't in the room. I think actually it's really difficult when in a more diverse classroom, unless they're really even numbers, you run, the, you run into the problem of the person, in this case, let's say Asian American student, being kind of singled out. And that actually is much more complicated and dangerous than in the all white kind of space, right? Um, I think it's actually, I think these things are more complicated when schools are not really, they're not all white, but they're not actually diverse. <laughs> you don't really have good solid numbers of different, you know, kids, but you have primary, like where I grew up, right? Like I was the, I was one of the only Asian American kids. Um, and, of course, in those days, we didn't talk about race, right? We talked around it. <laughs> um, but it's not as though people didn't have ideas about race, you know? And it wasn't until college that, you know, I had opportunities to learn more about Asian American history. And even then, of course, in those days, it was a predominantly white college as well. Um, so I think it, I guess your question is what 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 was your question? How do we start having these conversations? How do we work with kids? Yes. Yeah. I I guess I would back up one step and say we need to work with teachers first. Mm -hmm. Teachers need to know what they're doing. They need to feel comfortable to have these conversations. Um, another educational anthropologist, Micah Pollock, who's a professor at UC San Diego, writes about the fact that um, many teachers and schools experience a kind of color muteness, whereby they, they, they see race. I mean, 
if you have vision, you do see that, right? But you're afraid, many teachers are afraid of how to deal with race. So they talk around race. It's not as though we can be colorblind, right? Um, we see it, we make sense of it, but we don't know what, we don't know how to make sense of it. So the sense we make of it is often problematic. And I think Micah's work focuses a lot on how do we work with educators? She also does work with youth too, but how do we work with educators to get them more familiar with ideas around race and racism, more comfortable talk having these conversations? That it has to start in teacher ed programs among peers, right? I don't think we should just set people out on young people if they haven't been trained. This is my concern about ethnic studies. I think it's a great idea. On the one hand, really excited California is doing it. That's my home state, good for them. But on the other hand, if teachers don't know how to do it and aren't supported, it's likely to fail. And failure around these issues, this, this, they're pretty big consequences. It could further divide, it could further marginalize. Right, and we don't want further increased division or further marginalization of groups, right? So we need a lot of preparation to get teachers ready. So they have to think about like, how comfortable am I talking about race? Most people, not so much, right? Okay, that's where you are. Let's be honest about that. So how do we, what makes you uncomfortable? Uh, one of my former students, Angelina Castaño, um, who's a professor at Northern Arizona, um, has written about kind of the culture of niceness, she says, right? So there's a kind of culture of niceness, she argues, that really prevents us from tackling issues of race and racism and other forms of inequality, because it seems almost unseemly, right? Nice people don't mention race, right? So she did a lot of, she did research in Utah schools, um, or schools in Utah, I should say, um, where teachers kind of performed this kind of culture of niceness. So they talked around race, they avoided it. Even when kids wanted to ask reasonable, young kids wanted to ask reasonable questions. And Castaño argues that we're then giving kids the message that there's something wrong about talking about race. There's, there's something wrong about being demeaning. There's something wrong about expressing overt forms of racism, clearly, but there's not there's nothing wrong about sort of learning and asking questions, right? But, you know, in fairness to these teachers, they've been socialized into a kind of larger society and culture, Castagna would say, of niceness that leads them to avoid difficult conversations, right? So we have to learn how to have those difficult conversations. And those of us who work in teacher ed programs have to play that part. But, you know, we have a lot of teachers in the field already. So we need to, I don't do research or work in professional development, but I know that my colleagues who do that work talk a lot about how we need to do a better job in professional development. Um, teachers need to understand and be given the opportunity to be lifelong learners. The job of teaching changes. I can say the job of my, for me, even the job of teaching has changed in the decades I've been at the UW. And we have to adapt, we have to learn as our students change, as technology change, although clearly with technology, I'm not really barely passing grade here, but, but we have to try, right? We have to try, even if sometimes we fail, right? Um, I often tell my graduate students, like, you know, failure is inevitable as long as the failure isn't intentional <laughs> or isn't failure that hurts or harms anybody, right? Like, so you look foolish. We all look foolish sometimes, right? That's how we learn. That's right. In addition to the Vietnam War, what other historical moments would you want teachers to be sure to teach about Asian Americans? Well, the Vietnam War would be specifically with respect to Southeast Asians, right? So specifically with respect to Southeast Asians, I would want them to know obviously about um, the Vietnam War, I would also want them to understand the process of resettlement, right? Kind of how did people come to come to live in the United States? Why is it that, you know, people often wonder, and I think it's a good question, why is it that the, that um, there's such large communities of Hmong folks in the uh, Minnesota, uh, in the Twin Cities and Wisconsin, right? So what we know is that, um, you know, resettlement policies 
actually attempted to disperse Southeast Asians across the nation so as to quote unquote, not overwhelm any one single community, right? And also based on the assumption that uh, disbursement would lead to quote unquote, ass faster assimilation. But the good news is we live in a free and open society. People can move and make choices. That's good news. Um, and we're talking about a group of people for whom extended family is paramount, right? And so the reason that we have clusters, such large clusters of Hmong folks, for example, in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Fresno, California, has a lot to do with, you know, the pull of extended family and social networks, right? So what the research on immigration shows is that strong co-ethnic networks are crucial in uh, immigrant and refugee uh, incorporation, successful incorporation, right? Um, you know, they help each other out, in other words, they share information. And when you are not yet fluent in English, not yet proficient in English, you need people who can speak your language to tell you how to get a job, how to enroll your kids in school, how to get health care, um, how to find a, a, you know, affordable housing, right? Um, so, you know, the networks are very important for those kind of practical things that then lead to self-sufficiency and social mobility, but they're also important for the culture, right? They, that we're talking about groups of people for whom the extended family is everything, right? It's not just the nuclear family unit, it's the extended family and the ability to um, celebrate, um, you, know, you know, good news as well as to mourn death in community is very important for these communities. And that's why we had, you know, the sort of secondary migration that ended up to clustering in Wisconsin, um, California, and uh, Minnesota. Also, of course, the um, opportunities, economic opportunities in these places, um, the kinds of work that these communities um, could do based on the level of job experience and skills they had in the first generation. Let's all thank Dr. Stacy Lee very much for a very interesting discussion and very important discussion. Um, we will see the next slide, Amy. So, thank you. so we need our conclusions. Okay, so what can we all do now that we have heard uh, this presentation. Well, uh, we definitely need to take a look at Dr. Lee's books. Um, <laughs> they are listed here, Unraveling the Model Minority Stereotype and also Up Against Whiteness, Race, School and Immigrant Youth. And I've also included a shortened list of edited books and volumes. I mean, she's, she's just written just tons of articles and edited books. Um, but this is a shorter list, excuse me, um, that is most relevant to our current discussion of immigrant youth, excuse me. Next slide, please. <coughs> also important. There are websites um, to look at here too, listed AsianAmerican.edu, uh, uh, socialjusticebooks.org, and um, and so forth. So you can see, you can see those. Also, our name is not just a diversity learn learning team. Our name is diversity action team. So action is definitely what we're all about. Teaching is leading, so we can um, teach others what we have learned and please do share everything today that you've learned and, and continue to learn. And uh, youth lead as well. And um, of course, along with this, no one needs to be perfect, but we all need to be good learners. And also practice what we learn. When you see something happening in, in your everyday life, please, if it, if it is discriminatory, if it is 
negative, please, please um, say something, do something so that you can educate other people um, so they can do better. We need to do better so that they can do better as well. So please, next slide. Thank you all for attending. Um, the recording of this program will be posted on the Hedberg Public Library YouTube, YouTube channel. And we can also uh, post the uh, recording on several Facebook pages, DAT's website and Facebook pages, and also those of our partners. We definitely will do that. So if you're interested in contributing next year for with our DAT programming committee, please, we always need more people. Um, so volunteer and help out. Thank you again for, for uh, coming and all of you. And thank you, Dr. Stacy Lee. I, I am so grateful for you coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for joining tonight and listening and asking such great questions. I really appreciate it. And thanks Susan and Amy for all your help. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too. Thank you so much, Susan. This was an excellent program. Thank you. And in just a couple minutes, we'll, uh, we'll have our critiquing the process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just to let you know, I, oh, hold on.